Well, good morning. And welcome to worship this morning. We are so happy that you have come to join us in worship. And we are blessed to be able to share with you the word and this meal of forgiveness and reconciliation this morning. You'll learn in the gospel lesson and the message today that worship can happen anywhere that we realize we are in the presence of Jesus. And that means even when we have little glitches in the morning, like our projector not working. So, as you notice on this side, you're going to have to twist your neck um, to see the words. And we apologize for that. Um, but we know the spirit of worship will still bless you. Announcements this morning, most of them you can find in the pink messenger. I love the color. Uh, one thing to know, the Crosslines Eclipse Hunger um, donations you receive Eclipse glasses. She ran out of glasses already. We've raised already 300 plus, and she's going to get more, so we'll have them hopefully next week. Um, you can bring canned goods or $5. The Eclipse is on August 21st, and there's actually a viewing party at Crossline, so if you'd like to join that, you can. There is uh, a couple things going on just this week. Uh, grief Share begins tomorrow night. Uh, grief Share is for um, those who have had uh, a death in their families or friends, someone near to you, whatever reason that you're experiencing grief at the death of someone. And this is a support group, a 13-week course that um, you're invited to attend and just show up. And that's about it that you can read the rest of it um, on your own. Oh, restorative yoga is next Saturday. Uh, and we'll be kicking that off. So any of you yoga fans or want to learn how to do yoga, 8.30 a.m. Saturday, August 19th, we're going to start. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we are blessed to be a blessing. May we release those burdens and stresses in our lives now and receive this hour of your spirit filling us. May we be refreshed, renewed, and loved in this time as we receive the news of your forgiveness of good news and of love in jesus name amen let's sing
living together in trust and hope, we proclaim our faith. We believe in one God in three persons, a triple bloom on a single stem. God the Father, who created the universe and is continually creating us. God the Son, who redeemed us by coming and pitching his tent next to ours. God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us and is the love that gives our life meaning. We worship one God in three, and three in one, in this belief is life everlasting. Eleison, Lord, have mercy. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Every day of our lives, we sin against you with our actions and our inability to act, as well as our hurtful words of painful silence. We continually drop the ball. Sin has consumed our lives and there are a lot of things we have not done, but should be doing to glorify your name. We have held back from loving you fully. We have focused on loving ourselves, and with what we have left, we have not reached out to our neighbors. Your son sacrificed and died for us. Show us your mercy, forgive our sins, Refresh our hearts and guide us through our days. We love you and want to be like you. We are thankful for your grace so that our sins do not permanently separate us from you. Amen. Receive the words of absolution. Oh Lord, thank you for your good news that you love us and that nothing, nothing, nothing will separate us from your love. Help us 
when we do not believe this. Help us when we doubt that in our doubt we may worship. And in our worship, we worship because we know we are forgiven. So know now, by the power of Jesus Christ as a called and ordained minister of the Church of God, I therefore proclaim the entire forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Reading from the Holy Gospel, according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain to, by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat whispered, worshipped him, saying, 
truly you are the Son of God, the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Oh, wait, no. The peace of Christ be with you all. <laughs> Please share that peace with one another, and then you may be seated. So for our um, children's message today, we're actually going to do blessing of the backpacks. And so I want to invite all students to, um, to come forward. And if you have your backpacks along, please bring them. And as they're coming up, I ask all parents, caregivers, teachers, coaches, and all who otherwise work in preschool, school, college, university, or other places of learning to please stand that we might honor you as you begin the new school year as well. All right, so kids, you guys can kind of gather around here. And so we're going to first say a prayer for the adults, and then we're going to bless our backpacks, okay? All right, you can sit on the floor. All right. So first, a prayer for our adults. Let us pray. O oh God of wisdom, in your goodness you provide faithful parents, teachers, and mentors. We pray your blessing on all those who stand with these students. Whatever their task or role, guide them to do it in love and faithfulness to you, knowing that even the most ordinary tasks becomes extraordinary when done in your name. Amen. Now we're going to bless our backpacks so you can kind of hang on to them or just join in the prayer. That's okay. So imagine your blessing one, my imaginary backpack right here. All right, let's pray. God of all wisdom, and knowledge, these students and backpacks remind us that a new school year is beginning. So we pray your blessing on these backpacks and on all of these students, young and old. Help them discover and develop the gifts that you have given them, and as they grow in knowledge, help them so they may also act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Thanks for coming up, and have a great year. Remember, you're blessed to be a blessing, so go out. So you may or may not have noticed, um, I've been doing a sermon series on Romans since June, and as I struggled to figure out what I was going to say for Romans 10, Matthew 14 just kept coming up. So I decided to go with it, and we are going to talk about Matthew instead. So, Matthew 14. I want you to imagine... It's 3 a.m., your kids are sound asleep, all is well with the world, and the phone is ringing. You experience a sinking feeling, that one that starts about right here in your chest and drops to the bottom of your gut. Because you know, it can't be good news, a phone call at 3 a.m., the 3 a.m. phone call, some of you may remember this, became 
part of the lexicon of the 2008 presidential election. Hillary Clinton created this commercial. It was an ad asking, who do you want answering the phone in the White House at 3 a.m.? Now that commercial was spoofed by multiple people. You can find a lot of them on YouTube. Saturday Night Live did a very good one. But that fundamental experience of fear and doubt and anticipation was something very relevant to us then, now, and yep, even in biblical times. The gospel this morning says that Jesus walked on the sea to meet his disciples during the fourth watch. And the fourth watch was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Unlike today, nothing good came during the fourth watch. You know, God does have a way of turning things inside out and making the good, the bad, and the ugly somehow beautiful. And God does so with the fourth watch. In the beginning of chapter 14, if you were here last week, you would have heard this beginning story. But if not, let's do a review and catch up. Chapter 14 shares the news of the death of John the Baptist, who has been beheaded. This is Jesus' friend, cousin, someone he loved. And Jesus is grief-stricken. So he decides to cross the Sea of Galilee to a deserted place, a lonely place, so that he can have time to grieve and to be sad and to process his grief. Only the people follow him. And when he gets there, there's ten to 15,000 people in need. And he feels compassion for them, and so he delays his respite and instead provides them with healing and with teaching. And eventually the people get hungry, and so they're fed with a little that becomes enough. Two fish and five loaves miraculously supplies all, just like our meager meal of bread and wine, it feeds our spiritual being, fills us and sustains us with forgiveness and reconciliation. So finally, there comes a time when the crowds are actually sent away. He does send them away. This is uh, right after they try to forcefully make him king. Um, but Jesus won't have any of that. See, this is a foreshadowing of what is yet to come, but Jesus will review who he is in his own time. He's not going to be forced by a crowd on their time because he's a different kind of king. He's God, but no one gets that yet. So Jesus sends his disciples out on the boat away to cross the Sea of Galilee back to where it, the world is populated. So he stays in the deserted place. Uh, we presume to join them later. Finally, he has time to pray alone. He has time to rest. He has time to grieve and feel his sadness and his pain. But even then, all is not calm. The unpredictable weather of the Sea of Galilee presumes and it blows and the disciples are panicked and it's 3 a.m. and Jesus sees that they're in trouble and so he goes to them walking on the sea. Now in verse 26, it says that they cry out, it's a ghost, which you can kind of understand. It was a really dark night and he would have looked kind of like this little blob floating on the water and then all of a sudden have the outline of a human being. And easily, 
you would recognize this as something out of the ordinary, something too astonishing to be real, so maybe it is a phantom. But Jesus calls to them and says, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a phantom. Jesus says, take courage, I am, fear not. So at 3 a.m., with the sea torturing the boat and the disciples not knowing if this is Jesus or not, is finally assured it's not a ghost. That is Jesus, and that's good news. But there's a little more to that than just Jesus assuring them that, hey, I'm not a ghost, it's me, really. Hi, guys. See, for the sake of good English, <laughs> our Bibles tend to translate this, and you can see it on the, on the slide. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. I guess it's over there for you. <laughs> take heart, it is I. Or, I am here. Or, take heart, it's me. But the Greek is ego imi, and that means I am. What he said is, take courage, heart, courage. I am. And that means something. It would have meant a lot to the pe people first listening to this. And it means a lot to us now. You see, Moses, when he was speaking to God in the burning bush, asks God what God's name is. And God says, my name is I Am. Yahweh, I am the great I am. So now, here's Jesus. The crowd has tried to force him to claim who he is, to be claim that he is the king, and he rejects that. Because he's going to reveal himself in his own time, and it's now on the sea, in fear, where he reveals himself to be God. And that his presence gives courage not to be afraid. He demonstrates his power over natural forces, calming the sea. Power of God. Therefore, do not be afraid. If you haven't figured it out, this story is very heavily symbolic. Okay, there's a lot of inside stuff in that story. One of the symbols that's there is the, it's a, a meta, the boat is a metaphorical symbol of the church. This message was written to a community that Matthew was ministering to, a community that would have lived in, in or near Jerusalem. It was written in 80 to 85 AD, and at that, that time, the world would have seemed torturous, in a lost place. See, the destruction of Jerusalem had occurred in 70 AD, and it left the church small and fragile, feeling like they were adrift in waters of chaos, as if the church was sailing against the wind, as if the wind was against them. Where do the faithful row their boat? Are we in the middle of tumultuous sea and a time of disconnection and fragility, yet clinging to our faith, yet feeling exhausted by fear, even today? What do we do when Jesus comes? Do we get out of the boat? <laughs> Maybe not. I'm going to present a little twist to this text than you may have heard it done before. So usually pastors talk about Peter. Peter gets out of the boat. He walks in the water toward Jesus. Then he has this moment of fear, and he begins sinking, and he asks for help, and Jesus helps him. And he has this kind of failure of enough faith, but we can do better. We can be faithful and trust. Well, yes, 
Uh, don't dismiss the need for courage and faith and boldness to do great things in Christ. But I have to wonder about Jesus' response to Peter taking those steps out of the boat. He says, Oh, you of little faith. Little faith, he just walked on water. Why did you doubt? Now, was he referring in doubt to the regular old logic of galing winds blowing against you and knocking you off balance and causing you to drown or to feel that old sinking feeling, you know? Or is he referring to some other kind of doubt? See, there are several occasions in Matthew where... Jesus refers to people being of little faith. It's usually the disciples, and it's usually when they don't get the meaning of a story or when they fail to be able to exercise demons from someone. To be of little faith is to be among the disciples, struggling, asking questions, misunderstanding, fearing, starting all over again, basically being human. And it's also to be with a circle of those who have at least glimpsed who Jesus is, right? I want you to take a little step back in the story, not from Peter walking on the water, but right before that. See, when Jesus is heading toward the boat to presumably get into it, Peter interrupts him. Peter says, Lord, if it is you, then command me to come to you on the, on the water. And Jesus says, come. And then Peter sinks and asks for help, and Jesus helps him, saves him. But he does not ask Peter, why were you afraid? He asks, why did you doubt? And that particular word for doubt is only used twice in the entire Bible. And it's used in Matthew. This word for doubt is a word that does not mean, there's another Greek word for doubt that is used in the Bible, and that one means the doubt that comes from fear. But this one is not that one. This one is the doubt that does not mean the doubt that comes from fear. This is about a more rational doubt, a logical doubt, as in the doubt about who Jesus is. Is Jesus who he says he is, who he appears to be? The other place that word, Greek word for a doubt is used is Matthew 28 at the end of the gospel when Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection and it says they worshipped him, but some doubted. And in both of these places, there is doubt occurring, and at the exact same time, there is worshipping occurring. And those who are doubting are called, commissioned, and told to reveal to the world who Jesus is, even though they're doubting who is Jesus. And yet they're worshipping. So how did... Peter doubt? What is it that Jesus is asking him? Why did you doubt? It's in that moment when he interrupted Jesus. When Jesus says, take courage, I am, do not be afraid. I am being, I am God. I am the Son of God. He says a really big if. <laughs> he says, if it is you then command me to come to you. If. That's the big smack of doubt. The need to test something out. The word if occurs in Jesus' ministry when he is in his hometown, when he is in the wilderness with the devil, and near the end of Matthew. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. And just as Jesus declares that he is... I am, Peter basically responds to this huge statement by saying, well, if that's true, 
then make me do something really big, like walk on water. And then Peter fails, and Jesus chides him, as if asking, Peter, what are you doing outside of the boat in the first place? Sometimes it's enough to be in the boat. We don't think much about those 11 disciples in the boat. Remember, the boat is a symbol of the church. What about those? Those who continued to row and pull against the wind, who sat in the dark with Jesus and a soaking Peter, who felt moved to worship and praise. There is something to be said about believing the words, take courage, I am, fear not. I think the preacher Barbara Brown Taylor sums this up the best, and so I'm just going to share her little message about this. If there is a miracle worth savoring in this story, then it's maybe not that Jesus walked on water. After all, he's God. And walking on water is no more amazing than you and I walking up a staircase. And the miracle is not that Peter managed the same trick for a moment or two. No, the miracle is that when it was all said and done, when the soggy, chagrined Peter sputtering seawater out of his lungs, and as the boat continued to bob around in the dead of the rather dark night, somehow in the midst of those humble surroundings, way out there in the middle of nowhere, the disciples realized that no one less God's own son was sitting right in front of them. So they worshipped him. They believed. So having courage to be a visionary, willing to step out of the boat, is an amazing and needed thing, and the church needs you. But you know what? There are times in the life of the church... <laughs> When the boat is worth recognition, those who still keep rowing the oars against the wind, believing that Jesus is near and pressing on in faith, are bearers of humble courage. Take courage. So maybe you hear God's still small voice in ordinary surroundings, serving God by doing nothing extraordinary but profoundly ordinary. That's faith. That's the kind of faith that keeps you from sinking. That's the kind of faith that helps in times of trouble. So, I want you to consider this. It's 3 a.m. Your kids are sound asleep. All is well with the world. And the phone is ringing. And you experience that sinking feeling from your chest to the bottom of your gut. And you pause for a moment. And you remember the words. Take courage. I am. Fear not. Now, answer the phone.
God, you are a generous God, a compassionate God. We gather today to pray for our church, for the world, and for all those in need. We pray you continue to send out your church, all of us. May we be earth to this earth, light and salt to the world. Keep giving us a heart to do your work. You are an amazing creator who quiets the seas, you silence the wind, restore creation to perfection and beauty. Lord, you are a redeemer. We pray that leaders are inspired to righteousness so that justice thrives in our world and you are a sustainer God comfort those who are lonely and fearful those who are burdened by doubt give meaningful work to those who seek employment and walk with those who are grieving or ill and those who fa face the last days of their lives we especially lift up Linda Binder Ron Fells June Danka and we thank you for the healing of Dan Carlson Lord in your mercy Oh God, you are an encourager, and we thank you for encouraging us, for empowering us. Now may we find boldness in us ourselves, boldness to proclaim your love, boldness to live out your love, that we may share the words of hope and kindness, that we are equipped to use our hands and our feet and our voices and our minds to share all that you have given us, that we are so blessed that we may be a blessing and share those blessings with others. We rejoice in the example of saints that have gone before us, especially nurses. We remember Florence Nightingale and Clara Moss both renewers of society. Thank you for those who are so inspired and so moved to live out your healing power. We pray all this and those things that are unspoken and spoken, knowing and trusting that our prayers are heard and that your mercy abounds. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We do give thanks and we praise and we worship today, remembering the meal of forgiveness and reconciliation that Jesus gave us. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it broke it and gave it to all those gathered, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again after supper he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do so remembering Christ died, Christ risen, and Christ shall come again. O oh Lord, we pray you teach us to pray and we say these words you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. This meal has been prepared, and all are welcome to receive this meal of forgiveness. The ushers will let you know when to come forward. You may kneel or stand along the railing. Today we are communing by intinction. So you will receive the bread, the wafer, and then you will hold on to it as the next server comes with the cup. And you may dip it in either the red liquid, which is uh, wine, or the light liquid, which is grape juice. There are gluten-free elements available. Just let your server know that they are needed. Come, the table is prepared. Let us eat. This is a body. This is a blood. Broken and poured out for all of us. And in this communion, we share in his love. This is a body. This is a blood well, I will remember everything, Lord, that you've done for me. I won't take for granted the sacrifice that set me free. I hunger and thirst for your love. Come fill me today. This is the body. This is the blood. Broken and poor. Yeah. 
I invite you to please stand and receive the communion blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. And as we go out, receive this blessing. Now may the power of God strengthen you day by day. May the love of Jesus Christ heal you in wounds, and may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you now and forever. Amen.